It's good to be with you. If you could um, have that passage that was read for us open uh, in front of you, it would be a great help uh, to both of us, to me and to you as we go through Luke chapter 12. The, the words, when they're put together, financial and crisis, are words that are familiar to us. They've been ringing in our ears now for quite some time, quite a bit longer than we might have hoped, and they will probably continue to ring in our ears for a while. It was once just the topic of conversation of a few who were into that sort of thing, perhaps the financial boffins, but actually now words like economy and quantitative easing and global debt and things like that are words that are heard in chit-chat from the dining room to the boardroom and beyond. Jobs have been lost, marriages have been broken, and uh, even riots have been caused, we've been told, because of the financial crisis that has gripped the world over the last while. So money continues to make the world go round. Uh, The song is right. And it is an important thing. Money is important. We need it in order to live. And so the question is, if we need some, how much do we need? Uh, That's a question that's been asked and a question that's been answered over the years. John D. Rockefeller, the oil magnate, years ago was asked the question, was one of the people, probably the wealthiest man in the world at the time, he was asked, how much is enough? And he said, always a little bit more. And uh, that, is, uh, that is an issue. Money is a big issue uh, for all of us. It impacts all of our lives at some point or another. And money and how we handle it remains that perennial question, and it has always been a perennial question. It is the issue before us in this passage that was read for us this evening. Jesus, if you see at the start, is being drawn into a family dispute, and that dispute is about money. And his point this evening, the point of what we're looking at this evening is this. A relationship with Jesus, a relationship with Jesus should radically alter our relationship with money and wealth and possessions. That's where our text starts, verse 13. Uh, If we look down, siblings are arguing over an inheritance. And we're told, verse 15, the root of the problem, the root of the argument is greed and over-concern with money. And the passage ends, verse 33, if we look to the bottom, with Jesus urging those who will follow him to give away their possessions, to sell them for the sake of the poor, to be prepared to give them up themselves for the benefit of others. It's a big question then that is before us. How do we get from one to the other? How do we get from the greed that seems to be uh, dogging this family dispute at the beginning to being those who can give away for the sake of others. And irrespective of what we believe, it is a question that concerns us because I suspect we'd all, no matter what we believe, no matter where we've come from this evening, we'd all like to be known as generous people. And no matter where we come from, no matter what we believe this evening, uh, we can see that being greedy is not a good thing. So how do we move from one to the other? Well, the Christian faith holds the key, and in particular, what Jesus says here this evening holds the key. There are three aspects that I want us to see in this passage about what Jesus said that helps us go from being greedy to being generous, or go from being uh, uh, leaning towards greed towards leaning towards being generous. As we move from one to the other, it is a spectrum, but it is what Jesus teaches us here that will help us to do that. Three things I want us to see. The first is verse 15. There is a warning to heed. A warning to heed. So verse 13, there is this family dispute teacher. He says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. It's probably a younger sibling who wants to get his hands on the inheritance, and he asks Jesus to hand it over, to tell the brother to to hand it over. And Jesus replies, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? He's saying, look, I didn't come to earth for such matters as this. I didn't come, God with flesh on, to the earth in order to arbitrate family disputes. Verse 15, then he said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, here's the thing. Why does he say, watch out? 
The, the, the word is literally danger, beware. Well, the issue is this family is being torn apart by greed, but they can't see it. If you look back at the previous section, if, if you've got your Bibles there on page 1045, the previous section, uh, there is this crowd of people being taught about the things of eternity. Don't worry if it's not open in front of you. I'll read it. Chapter 12, verse 2. Jesus says, There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What he's saying is what happens here echoes in eternity. One day there will be a great revealing of everything. Verse 5, he then says, Fear him who after killing the body has the power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. So Jesus is talking about big things. This is no small issue that he's just been teaching the crowd about. Eternity hangs in the balance, he says. Heaven and hell are at stake here. Verse 13, Tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. You see, eternity one second, the big things of life and death, the very next minute, tell him to share the stuff with me. Jesus is saying here, watch out because we're blind to our greed. It hides itself from us. How many of us would describe ourselves here as materialistic or greedy or even preoccupied with money? Probably very few of us because we don't see it can't think of anywhere in the Bible where Jesus says, watch out against adultery. It's not that adultery isn't as destructive as greed, it's just that it isn't as deceptive. I heard someone put it well, they said, it's hard not to notice when you commit adultery. But greed is much less obvious. Think about it. Internet pornography is seen widely as a huge problem, and it is. But internet shopping carries none of the same stigma or the sense of guilt, and yet it enslaves many without us even realizing. One pastor puts it well when he says it like this, spiritually speaking, sex has slain its thousands. Money has slain its tens of thousands. Think of the number of people uh, in the media, maybe even people you know, maybe even you, for whom money and the effect of money has devastated your life or their life or relationships. Now, as we'll see in a minute, it isn't uh, about money in and of itself. It's important to say that. It is possible to be wealthy without being greedy. There are lots of examples in the Bible of wealthy people who aren't greedy people. But the point that Jesus is making is no one who thinks, no one who is greedy actually thinks they're greedy. So watch out. So it will mean for us stopping and thinking asking questions about how we spend, being self-suspicious about our ability to handle money, asking ourselves hard questions about why uh, we buy and what we buy. You see, Jesus says, verse 15, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Greed raises its head in different ways for different people, and we'll spot other people's greed whilst being blind to our own. Look, we live in one of the wealthiest parts of one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We will be easily self-deceived. We need to watch out, Jesus says. There's a warning to heed, but how do we know if we have a problem here? Greed is pretty widely acknowledged to be when money is too important, too central to you. Okay, so we've said that we're easily self-deceived, but we also have a tendency to use comparison As our guide, we look at others, and where there are wealthier people around us, as there always will be, we will point at them and say, they have a bigger house, they have a bigger car, they have more holidays, they are clearly more preoccupied with money than me. But that isn't necessarily the case. So how do we know if we have a problem? So we heed the warning, yes, I need to be on guard, but how will we know if we have a problem? Well, that's where Jesus goes next. Second thing he wants us to see are the signs to notice, the signs to notice. Verses 18 and 19, see them there, and then he says more about it again in verses 22 and following. Greed, when money is in control of our lives, will show itself in two ways. That's what Jesus says. First of all, hoarding it when we have it. See this with the rich man. Verse 18, do you see, I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my grain and goods. And I'll say to myself, 
You have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. The rich man has no thought of sharing his wealth around. It's his after all. He earned it. He can keep it. Do you notice how many times he refers to himself? It's actually 11 times as we go through. My grain, my goods, and my stuff. It's all mine. I'm going to do what I want because it's mine. It all belongs to me. So verse 21, he builds bigger barns. He stores up things for who? For himself. He kicks back and enjoys his wealth without regard for anyone else. He is the embodiment of a spender. Opulence is a sign that you're greedy. Extravagant consumption without due regard for others. When some people talk about this guy, they kind of depict him as the, the city high flyer. Uh, homes all over the world, a private jet, hot and cold running sports cars, that kind of thing. That may be so, but it's possible to have the same mindset on a modest income. Holding on to every penny of your money for your use. It's all for you. It's the same greed expressed in a different way. You can hoard wealth without displaying it to the world. Hoarding the wealth we have for us is the first sign Jesus highlights in the parable that we have a problem with greed. Much more subtle, however, is the second sign, and it's this. It's there in verses 22 and following. Worry when we don't have it. Worry when we don't have it. Therefore, I tell you, verse Uh, 22, Jesus says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Jesus mentions worry five times in this short section. And what's worry got to do with greed? Well, why does this come straight after the parable of the rich, uh, the rich fool? Well, think about it. If Jesus is saying that storing things up for yourself is folly, the natural response will be to worry. How will I survive if I don't have my stuff? Here are the disciples being called to follow Jesus with everything. How will they live? Well, here's the thing. Jesus is saying, if you worry about money, your clothes, your standard of living, you're just as consumed with money as the one who is wealthy and uses their wealth to draw attention to themselves and for their good. If you worry about money, it's not about prudent financial planning. It's not about making wise decisions about the finances that you have at your disposal. But worrying about it. And if you worry, it means that it has a control over you. It has a hold over you. It is a controlling factor in your life. See, Jesus knows that you don't need to have money to have a problem with greed. You don't need to have money to really, verse 29, set your heart on stuff, or verse 30, run after such things. Worry about money, Jesus says, is a sign that you're just as absorbed by wealth as the obvious consumer, the one that everybody thinks is materialistic or flash. That's true. In fact, both the hoarder and the worrier uh, look down on each other. The hoarder looks at the, at the, uh, at the, the worrier and says, they're a miser. They wouldn't spend Christmas. And the, the other one, the, the, the spender, uh, that the uh, worrier looks, the hoarder looks at the worrier and says they're a miser. The worrier looks at the hoarder and says they're a flash harry. They're gauche. They have the same root problem. Money controls them. Greed is in the driving seat. Their heart is controlled by money. This is part of a bigger problem. You see, hoarding and worry are telltale signs for two very important reasons that Jesus makes clear as he then draws his disciples' attention. You see, verse 24 to the ravens and to the lilies then, verse 27. He's making the point, Jesus is making the point here that only God can provide those things to which people become greedy in order to attain. People are greedy because they want the things that only God can give. What are they? First one, verse 24, is security. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? The rich man, verse 19, 
is, is uh, talking this through with himself. His aim is to secure his future. Uh, plenty of good things laid up for many years. I say to myself, self, I'm going to build bigger barns and so on. He's planning to control the future, thinking that his wealth will make him safe and secure. How many of us think like this? If I just have a, if I had a little bit more, then I'd be set. Then I'd be secure. Then I'd be able to kick back and everything would be okay. I'd be safe. If I had more money, perhaps I'd be able to get the security system that I need. Money is good. Money is a good thing. The Bible speaks about money positively uh, more times than it does negatively. It is a good thing. It is a convenient thing. But there is no security in wealth. The financial crisis that we are seeing unfold around us is proof positive of that fact. There is no security in wealth. We think even that wealth liberates us to do all kinds of lovely things, but the reality is if you can't give what you have away, there's no liberty. You're enslaved. And so you're not secure. You're insecure because you're owned by your wealth, that thing which is so fickle. I mean, we kind of know this. Wealthy people often have a terrible time in relationships. The rich and famous are not more relationally stable because of their wealth. In fact, the opposite is true. Prenuptial agreements. Why? Because they can never be sure whether people really want them or want their money. Wealth makes life more insecure, especially because when the day comes, the day, that day in the future when Jesus returns, wealth will never save us. Or even before then, the day when our life is taken from us. Wealth is no good to us then. It's a cliche because it's true. There are no pockets in a shroud. You can't take it with you. Your wealth is of no value at that point. And that's Jesus' point with the rich fool. He's got his barns. He's got his security systems. He's got his investments. He's got the best of everything. Verse 20, do you see? But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Very humbling, isn't it? His funeral was a grand occasion. His wealth made him an influential man. Wealth opens doors. People want to know you if you have wealth. It opens doors into high places. He was very influential in all kinds of circles in which he moved. Many people of great renown gave glowing eulogies about him at his funeral. He was spoken of in lofty terms during the funeral service. But when they went to the graveyard, they found that God himself, the only one whose eulogy matters, had already engraved the headstone. It's just two words. You fool. The fool in the Bible is the person who acts without regard for God. And so he's saying, finding one's security in wealth is the ultimate folly. Jesus says, consider the ravens. There's no security in wealth. And the same is true, verse 27, with beauty. That's what people want from money, security and beauty. Verse 27, consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. How much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Lots of people see money as a means of becoming attractive. It gives them self-worth and importance and will make people like them and love them. So they spend a lot of money on clothes and external things because if they look a certain way, they will be well-received by others. They'll be popular. They'll be desirable. They'll be beautiful. And that's what the, uh, the advertisers have trained us to believe. If we have their product, it'll make us beautiful and it'll save us from ugly hell or whatever it is. Provide the beauty savior. Money can make the outside a little more appealing to the eye of some. Because it's very fickle. Beauty is, after all, in the eye of the beholder. What is beautiful to one person is not beautiful to another. And money doesn't even guarantee external beauty. 
Uh, I heard an interview a, a while ago on the radio, Radio 5, with Katie Price, Jordan, the glamour model. And she uh, had just spent, she said, $12,000 having her hair colored. $12,000 having her hair colored. But apparently it all went wrong. Some of it started to fall out, and it looked a mess. All that money to try and make herself look beautiful, and it didn't work. It happens all the time. And it's into this situation that Jesus says, the person who pursues beauty this way has missed the point. The same reason the rich man may have been attractive to others because of his wealth, but only God can make you truly beautiful. And most of all, only God can make you fit for his presence. If you're looking to money to make you beautiful, it has limited success physically and no success eternally. It doesn't matter how much you've got or how good you look. If God demands your life from you and that was all you had, those will be the words that ring in your ears on that day. Verse 20, you fool. Consider instead the lilies. Signs that we are too centered on money are hoarding and worry, and they are a problem because they reveal a heart that is looking to money to deliver what only God can do. We're looking to money as a savior. It is the height of folly. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. The only legacy of wealth is its fleeting nature. Instead, richness towards God is where wisdom lies. Investing with him through the death and resurrection of his son, repenting of our self-salvation projects and running to him for salvation and security and beauty and true riches. Only Jesus Christ can bring the things that we pursue through our greed and only Jesus Christ can save us from our greed. If you're running after these things, can I urge you to stop? Don't build your identity in what you have. It is so offensive to God and it will never deliver. It is a treadmill that only gets quicker and steeper. You might get going, but there's always something bigger. There's always something better that sucks the joy out of the things that you have. And your desire to have it beats you. I must have it. It's like a cruel taskmaster that whips you. And of course, when we live like that, none of us know the moment when our life will be demanded from us. When God calls time on our days on earth, the worst thing imaginable to hear would be those words, you fool. So if it is all about money for you, whether you have much or little, repent and become rich toward God, deep, lasting, inner wealth in Jesus Christ. And it's from that point that true generosity is possible. Real generosity, non-self-interested, costly, sell all your stuff for the sake of others, generosity. And that's where Jesus concludes with his disciples. You see, even as those who are following Jesus, this kind of radical approach to money is hard. And Jesus knows this. So he reminds them, he reminds his disciples here of what they have as the basis for their generosity. And that's the third element, the third aspect of what Jesus says that we need to grasp. If we're going to move from greed or a propensity to greed to generosity, the third thing we need to understand is this, what we need to grasp is a status to understand, a status to understand. Verses 32 and 33, but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Those who seek the kingdom receive the kingdom. But the crucial thing here is that verse 33, do you see, comes after verse 32. Now, obviously it does, but look at the way those verses are put together. Jesus doesn't say, if you sell your possessions and give them to the poor, God will accept you into his kingdom. Nor does he say, look, I know this is really hard, but it's right that a Christian gives their money away and isn't controlled by wealth, so stop it, you naughty little Christians. He doesn't say that either. No. First of all, he reminds his disciples that God has given them the kingdom apart from their efforts. And because of that, they are a changed people. They have a new status. 
They are those who possess the kingdom and so are free to give in radical ways. It is from that security that therefore they are liberated to be generous. And when the Christian understands their status as one of God's people, that is, when we understand that we are the recipients of all that he has done for us in Jesus Christ, that is what changes our hearts. That is the only thing that will change a human heart from greed to generosity. Paul, The Apostle Paul, uh, later on in the Bible, puts the idea more clearly in his second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That is, Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, came to earth, leaving the riches of heaven to give up his power, his glory, his treasure, to generously pour out his wealth, giving everything for us spiritually bankrupt people when he gave his life on the cross for our sin. And in doing so, he brought us the kingdom. He made us citizens of heaven. He made us rich towards God. That is what has happened to us in Jesus Christ. That is what will happen to you if you give your life to Jesus Christ. If you say sorry for your sins and put your faith in him. And it is to the extent that we really know this to the extent that we know that we have been treasured by Jesus Christ, the one who paid the ultimate price to make us spiritually rich, that we will be able to see money as just money. It will cease to have control over us. We will no longer hoard what we have or worry about what we don't have. We won't need to find our security and our wealth because through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we know we've been treasured by God who loved us enough to send his son for us. And he will never let us go. And he can get us through death. That's security. It's the only security there is in our world. And we don't need to find our beauty through our wealth because through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are accepted and perfected before God who will never turn us away and from whose lips we will never, ever hear the words, you fool. Only in Jesus Christ is there an end to folly. Liberation from the greed that controls us and radical generosity that changes a society only come through knowing Jesus. So, tonight I'll urge you to heed the warning, to look for the signs, and to come to Jesus and understand the true riches that you have in him. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that in him we have all that the world looks to in other things. We have security, we have beauty. We have a kingdom we have a status we have a relationship that gets us through death itself we praise you for Jesus this evening we pray that you would write the truth of all that he says deep in our hearts that we might live differently that we might believe this and be changed we pray this in his name Amen